All right. Well, uh, thank you very, very much for letting me come into the MSA United Virtual Conference. I appreciate the Defeat MSA Alliance invitation for uh, letting me be part of this meeting. And I hope that this presentation uh, opens a few avenues that have really not been uh, probed in terms of multiple system atrophy, but in really in terms of our approach to neural degeneration in general. Uh, these are my disclosures here, and I trust that none of them are specifically relevant to the themes that I'm going to uh, mention here, with the exception that I am working in a uh, process of trying to develop a pro uh, replacement therapy strategies uh, for uh, neurodegeneration. Uh, the uh, model that we've used to understand aging is a forensic model. It is one in which we are interested in determining what is it that an autopsy material, that's the ashes of a proverbial fire, inform us in terms of how that fire got going. And whatever we have been able to determine is abnormal in a, an autopsy, we have uh, assumed that it is the cause of the problem. And I'm going to make the case that that approach is outdated and that it has led us astray. Uh, in one way in which it has led us astray is in the idea that if we find in the ashes of a fire alpha-synuclein, which is a protein that uh, is very, very important in all of us, but it accumulates in an aggregated insoluble state, giving rise to Lewy bodies in Parkinson's and uh, uh, intra oledodendroglial inclusions in multiple system atrophy, if those kinds of proteins are aggregated and found in autopsy, we imagine that anything that could have been related to it directly or indirectly is part of a biological system involved in that disease. This is a representation of what up to 2014 had been uncover for Parkinson's disease on the clinical pathologic model. Again, the model assuming that the pathology, that which is found on autopsy, explains the clinical features and therefore explains the disease. And think about this for a moment. This is a figure showing us a puzzle and the approach to diseases of brain aging to us has been as if we are trying to resolve a puzzle. A puzzle of so many different elements uh, has a problem because if you can imagine that you have a therapy that works by a given mechanism, if you look, if that mechanism is in the puzzle, then you want to use that particular uh, therapy because you think is in the puzzle that somehow plays out in everyone affected. But the problem with the idea of thinking about a puzzle is that uh, there are many other pieces. When do we know that we have the very last piece that makes the puzzle whole? That's a problem. Uh, and also, when do we know if the way in which we've put the puzzle together is actually fitting properly or whether there are some uh, forced pieces into it, as you perhaps can see here. So it's a problematic idea to look at a puzzle and not recognize that perhaps what we are really seeing or should be seeing is not just one, but uh, many different puzzles, uh, perhaps as many as people living with the diseases, right? We have all given uh, some uh, credence to the idea that uh, all of us are different. And yet we want to believe that those that have a particular disease uh, um, somehow are affected by a given mechanism at holes. Really are uh, on the idea that if, for instance, in the case of Parkinson's, but it will be the case in the case of uh, multiple system atrophy, Alzheimer's disease, 
frontotemporal dementia, et cetera, that really there are different subtypes. And in, we all intuitively know this, and it's important this because we know that each subtype will be treated in a manner that will be specific to that. That's not really where we are. We are in a position where we think that all of this, that if we learn about any subtype that, that informs everyone's disease. And because of that, then we've come to a point where all we have in terms of therapies aimed at slowing the progression of diseases, such as in this case, Parkinson's disease, it's really just littered with tombstones. And these are therapies that at many points in time were thought to be the cure. And of course, when given to people that didn't have the biology to benefit, or at least we never knew who among the individuals targeted would have responded, of course, the trials failed. And in fact, that keeps on happening such that we have more and more tombstones that accumulate and new therapies being examined for everyone, as if having the symptoms that we can define as a disease at the bedside somehow identifies a common biology. Now, normally, uh, the brain is uh, surrounded uh, by the soluble material, a liquid that essentially contains a variety of nutrients and proteins in their soluble state. Soluble means it can be dissolved in water, which is why we can measure it in liquid, such as the liquid that surrounds the brain that we can quantify by doing a spinal tap, for instance. Now, what happens between a normal state and an abnormal state is that the concentration of the proteins that are soluble depletes or reduces because they are turning into folded proteins that no longer can be soluble. They are away from the liquid and they are clumped up as you see in the brain. So essentially what you see here now without the animation is that what happens to us as uh, we age with a given neurodegenerative disease is that uh, normal proteins that give the richness to our, our brain by bathing it uh, through the liquid that is surrounding it, it becomes depleted because they are turning into clumps in the brain itself. And those clumps are what we then identify in the ashes of a fire in the autopsy and what we assume as the cause of the problem. When we may be forgetting that by no longer having the normal proteins, that's a problem because that's the part of the protein that will be functioning. So what this is, is uh, pretty much uh, following the loss of thermodynamics. And this is, as you see here, an example of two balls that in a specific uh, set, setup uh, would create the crystallization, the transformation of soluble to insoluble. Uh, that could also happen by seeding, as you saw in the example on the left. As this happens, the normal soluble protein transform into abnormal insoluble protein. The insoluble protein is no longer able to do any kind of function as it may have when it was in the normal state, which is soluble. Now, there are three mechanisms by which this can happen in neurodegenerative diseases. The most common is called heterogeneous nucleation, which is, for instance, uh, an agent that shouldn't be in the brain. This is an example of a virus that's dropped uh, into the brain. This would be the brain. And you can see that there is a higher concentration of that fluid because it has more of the normal proteins, as you saw in the example to the left and we reviewed above. So what happens if you do that is that this will act as a surface against which there will be a transformation creating the amyloids that you see here and lowering the concentration of the liquid because it will have fewer proteins. The other mechanism is seeding, 
and that's one that's uh, now used for the purposes of diagnosis. There is a seeding aggregation assay that's available to determine if somebody has Parkinson's or multiple system atrophy, for instance. And that's just simply uh, super saturating the solvent ag and adding seeds, which would then greatly uh, enhance this soluble to insoluble transformation. Obviously, with the end result still that you have a liquid with less concentration of normal proteins. And then finally, you have uh, a third mechanism, which is what happens in the rare cases in which there is a mutation that overexpresses a protein, renders it unstable, and it precipitates. So there is no need here of viruses or seeds because simply just any kind of peptide would give rise or any protein added onto it would just in, uh, make the, um, uh, the, the nucleation process uh, happen. So this is nucleation, nucleation meaning that there is a uh, form of crystallization is the mechanism biophysically of crystallization. And uh, that then gives rise to a depletion of proteins. So if we measure these proteins in spinal fluid, as you saw in the example uh, just that I illustrated before, you'll see that the levels are low. Here is the example of the levels of proteins in Parkinson's disease. All of them are actually lower complete, com compared to a uh, population of healthy controls. And in fact, we've shown that the lower the levels, the greater the brain atrophy. So levels of the, no of the normal fraction of the protein should be higher if to uh, be able to keep the brain volume and therefore the normal function uh, in the best possible way. Now, the reason I'm pointing this out is because in the literature and in language that we use among scientists, we use the word replication, not the word nucleation. Replication, though, is a very specific term that requires uh, a mechanism of faithful information transmission. And that mechanism is best uh, exemplified by the double helix. The double helix allows the replication of a fiber with a specific fidelity. It is insensitive to any extrinsic factors and it is active. It requires energy for it to occur, but it's nucleation independent. That makes it different to polymerization, which is a form of crystallization. And it is the example that we've seen in a, in a, in a Petri dish where you saw adding these two uh, balls, for instance, uh, creates a new, uh, uh, lowers the nucleation barriers and it allows the nucleation process, in this case, heterogeneous nucleation, to proceed. This is uh, an irreversible process and essentially is very dependent of the environment in which this occurs. So it has a high sensitivity to extrinsic factors. Um, there is no mechanism for this, though. So therefore, what you end up with is what's referred to as stochastic growth. You see a lot of these insoluble proteins forming, and this configuration is called beta sheet. So it's called a cross beta sheet configuration, which is essentially a really tight packed uh, set of uh, the proteins in a manner that is so stable as to be nearly irrelevant from a toxic perspective. So here's a way to think of the process of protein aggregation. Here you see an example of milk that has gone uh, bad. Uh, the milk has curded and it has undergone a protein transformation at three levels as it happens with all of the transformations in nature, including in our brains. At a structural level from normal to abnormal, the abnormal still is called cross beta, uh, which is the very tight pad configuration I mentioned. A biophysical transformation from soluble to insoluble and a biological transformation, functional to non-functional. So you end with something called an amyloid. Uh, Lewy bodies are amyloids. Intranuclear inclusions are like those seen in uh, multiple system atrophy are amyloids. Amyloids are a 
phase of the protein that is really the end result of a nucleation process that then renders these proteins no longer functional. So the process of protein aggregation begins with the normal protein and ends with the normal protein. In the literature, though, what you don't see much of is the normal protein. That's because going back to our forensic approach, what one sees in the ashes of the fire that gave rise to the classification of diseases, among them multiple system atrophy, is the insoluble protein that's left. But the normal soluble protein no longer is there. We don't see it. It has become invisible. But let us Let's remember that the protein aggregation is a process that begins with normal protein and ends with abnormal protein. So a certainty in biology is that proteins must be in their soluble state, their native configuration, to function. That the minute they misfold, they no longer function. That is a certainty. What is uncertain is whether proteins that misfold because they undergo nucleation by virtue of a virus or any other phenomena, that the minute they turn into amyloids, the amyloid form that I just explained earlier, they somehow turned into malignant elements of the brain that they, quote, replicate, propagate, or spread from cell to cell. That language of replication and propagation imply an active process about which there isn't a biophysical support. It is nucleation after all. So all our eggs are in this particular basket and have been for a long time. We have a lot of therapies in many fields that are trying to get rid of the proteins that on autopsy look bad. So we have felt that they must be the cause of the problem. And we have no, basket, no eggs in the basket of uh, the uh, called the so-called loss of function. LOF, loss of function, is what I think is most important for us to address because it is a certainty. And instead, moving from uh, the GOF, the gain of function, uh, I think we've spent quite a bit of effort and energy and many billions of dollars into this approach, and we have very little to show. So it's time to really get to the other basket and begin to test it. So a proposed model is that proteins really can function when they are in their normal state. This uh, in the y-axis is the soluble peptides. You wanna be up here, uh, but toward the right, of course, as proteins uh, begin to be transformed into insoluble uh, peptides, uh, as you can imagine, what happens is that there probably is a compensation period but a threshold below which any further reduction of the proteins is going to create symptoms. People will migrate from asymptomatic to early symptomatic. That's truly the certainty that is going to happen as we age with a neurodegenerative disease. What is uncertain, as I've mentioned, is the idea that as these proteins uh, turn into their insoluble counterparts that somehow their presence uh, is in any way toxic. Uh, we don't know about this, but every effort that has uh, made uh, inroads into trying to address this has really now panned out. So we need to really be quite uh, careful about continuing this uh, very uh, uh, devoted approach to removing abnormal proteins. So proteinopenia is the idea, uh, unlike proteinopathy, which is what we use, that explains or, or puts out the concept that proteins end up precipitating, not replicating, that that obeys a nucleation mechanism. And that as uh, they do, they let levels go down. They do not increase. And no one with a neurodegenerative diseases have high levels of any proteins. And this is important uh, in the case of synuclein, for instance, in Parkinson's and multiple system atrophy. But neurodegeneration in general is not a, protein, a problem of protein accumulation. After all, it's not as if the brain undergoes swelling. The brain shrinks. So the problem of neurodegeneration is of loss, including the loss of normal alpha-synuclein. 
So amyloids are not proteins behaving like viruses. They are proteins behaving like proteins. They polymerize, solidify, precipitate, change their conformation, have a function, or lose it if they turn into something that no longer can carry out their function. So if we can think of, for instance, the model again, and here is an example of an herpes simplex virus type one that shouldn't be in the brain, but when it's in the brain, it, it really triggers uh, the, conf, the, the, the nucleation of A beta 42. That's the protein that tends to be affected more uh, rapidly here. And what happens is that then it forms into plaques. So it really goes from soluble to insoluble and from functioning to non-functioning. So at one level, one potential strategy for future treatments is to develop this uh, same uh, analogs of the proteins in their normal state with a modification that would render them non-aggregating and then giving it to patients whose levels of this in the spinal fluid, the liquid that surrounds the brain, are lower than the compensation threshold. And therefore, keeping their brains as healthy as they can be, even if we don't know what at an individual level is creating this soluble to insoluble transformation of proteins. That's rescue medicine. Precision medicine is a higher level, and it would require for us to actually go to the source of the problem. That's going to be individualized because not everyone will have herpes simplex virus type 1 as the cause of their illness. It's only a very small minority of individuals that do. For them, antiviral treatments targeting this cause of their illness would be a cure. Uh, and that's an individualized, that's actually much harder to get to, but at least we can begin by recognizing that the loss of the normal proteins give us an opportunity to rescue the brain, even if we don't know what is it that the brain is fighting against. To get to that, what is it that the brain is fighting again at the University of Cincinnati, we're doing the CCBP, the Cincinnati Cohort Biomarker Program, which lives up to that idea. We're recruiting people with a variety of different conditions, including multiple system atrophy. And rather than thinking that's the truth, that's the gold standard against which to measure everything, that's not our truth. That's just a label. The measurements that we're uh, aiming at collecting our biological and are uh, meant to determine who are at the outliers of biology because somehow by doing that, then we can begin to tease out biological subtypes of disease about which we have therapies that we can correct. So this would be aiming toward precision medicine. And I think that this would be important because in a future precision medicine, we wouldn't be looking for hundreds of people for a trial, but relatively few individuals that are in a specific biological category for whom we, in fact, have a treatment. Now, this could be something that will work, of course, at one or two percent at a time, but for them, this would be a cure. Rescue, of course, would require for us to shift our paradigm and begin to move away from the idea that proteins are toxic to the idea that really we're losing proteins in neurodegeneration. And therefore, it's not proteinopathy, as you've heard uh, time and again, but proteinopenia, the loss of the proteins as they aggregate. If we can then shift our thinking in that manner, would allow moving disease-modifying efforts from anti-aggregation strategies that clean up the brain from these proteins, which really we're doing pretty well, all things considered, to soluble protein replacement. Now, rescue therapy is a step behind precision medicine, as I've just mentioned. So I hope that I've leaving you with the idea that by shifting our thinking about proteins in the brain, that we now have an opportunity to really rescue these proteins and that we must change our approach to get there. And with that, I thank you very much. Uh, and I hope uh, that this has been an, uh, an eye-opening presentation, clearly a different way to think at the problem, but we need to do that. Thank you so much.